The views expressed on the Jerry Cahill CF podcast are that of Jerry Cahill and guests, and not necessarily those of the Boomer Esiason Foundation. Nothing on the Jerry Cahill CF podcast should be considered medical advice. Such advice can only be given by a physician who is experienced with cystic fibrosis. The Boomer Esiason Foundation, Jerry Cahill and guests cannot be held responsible for any damage which may result from using the information on this podcast without the permission of your medical doctor. Welcome to Jerry Cahill's Living, Breathe, and Succeeding podcast series, the Path Forward with CF. This show was made possible through an educational program from Columbia University Medical Center and the Lung Transplant Project to the Boomer Esiason Foundation. You have a new set of lungs. That's pretty incredible. But it also means a new set of possible problems and a new routine. So we decided to go over what one should expect during their first year post-double lung transplant. Post-transplant pain is a significant issue for many CF patients. Uh, I think it's easy to understand why. Um, first of all, there's a very large incision that may span uh, from one side of the chest uh, to the other side. Uh, and in the old fashion it was done, it was called the clamshell operation where the chest is completely cut open from one end to the next so that it's open this way to allow good exposure for the surgeons uh, during their surgery. Um, in the past several years, our, our surgeons have tried to limit that incision and spare the sternum by uh, making two incisions on each side, but still each incision is five or six inches long and that causes a tremendous amount of pain because the muscles between the ribs are cut and there are nerves under each rib uh, and whenever that uh, area is cut open, it's going to cause tremendous pain. In addition, patients also have two to three chest tubes on each side to drain air and blood and liquid that is produced after transplant surgery. Uh, so they typically have two or three chest tubes on each side, causing tremendous pain. And pain limits uh, coughing, pain limits ambulation, so it's a significant concern. And the medications we use to control the pain can cause nausea, can cause constipation and other distressing symptoms. One of the ways we deal with that is to use, uh, in some instances, epidural uh, anesthesia. So we may be able to put a special catheter, like how uh, pregnant women uh, get before childbirth, uh, to control pain. This is placed in a upper thoracic or upper chest area to control the incisional pain. Um, we also use patient-controlled uh, analgesia that patients can use by pressing the button. Um, with or without a basal rate of pain medication to, to control the pain. In case of cystic fibrosis, one of the important things to do with pain management is to make sure that bowels continue to function because um, they're more prone to developing bowel obstruction uh, and we need to make sure we stay on top of that. Uh, as much as post-transplant pain is a significant concern pre-transplant, uh, we like to tell the patients that uh, we'll do everything possible to minimize the pain. Uh, there's really no such thing as painless lung transplant surgery. Uh, perhaps in the future we'll discover a way of doing that. But short of that, we have incredibly powerful medications that we could use to minimize the pain so patients can start ambulating as quickly as one to two days after their transplant surgery. So how should a patient feel after surgery? So in the first uh, few days, there's uh, all the symptoms we discussed, such as pain, nausea, poor appetite. All of those get controlled and start to go away in the first uh, week to two after transplant. Once they go home, typically the pain is a lot better, appetite is a lot better. They start ambulating more and start gaining their strength. Uh, they start doing things they haven't been able to do for months or years. Uh, so a lot of those uh, are very positive and they become more functional. After the first uh, two to three months, and I must say that this is incredibly variable from patient to patient, and it does depend on how strong they are going into transplant, typically patients start feeling really well. And by six months, they, uh, by six to 12 months, they typically reach their uh, peak in terms of how they feel from a physical perspective, but again, quite variable depending on what the patient is doing after transplant. Um, sometimes we find an interesting phenomenon. Patients 
feel great, they start doing a lot, and then they report that the pain comes back because they're doing things they haven't done for a long time and start stressing their incision. Uh, we tell them that's normal and that's going to go away. Uh, and then sometimes patients start doing a lot of the things they haven't done and find that they're limited by their musculoskeletal strength and stamina. And it's not because of lack of lung function when they complain of having low stamina and even feeling breathless, but not due to poor lung function, but due to musculoskeletal dysfunction. Some of it is pre-existing and it's very difficult and takes a long time to build up. Some of it also occurs due to the medications we have to use, such as prednisone or tacrolimus, that may uncouple um, um, electrical and physical muscle activity, and patients may be exercise limited due to these medications. Some people gain a lot of weight after transplant, so that may also limit them. Uh, and some people may become um, um, quite anorectic. They may lose appetite and lose weight, and that may also cause um, you know, muscle loss and loss of function. So all of those things we try to address with each and individual patient. There are several elements in a patient's uh, post-transplant care. Uh, the first element is uh, post-surgical care. So um, the incisional healing, the removal of chest tubes that take, uh, takes uh, several days. Uh, based on fluid and uh, air output that the lungs uh, have. Um, pain control, control of the gastrointestinal system and function and so on. Uh, so that's uh, in the initial uh, two to three weeks of transplant. At the same time, uh, medical care starts um, uh, actually right before surgery. So we start uh, intravenous antibiotics geared towards the specific organisms that a patient has pre-transplant, as well as anti-rejection and anti-infection medications right before, during, and after transplant. Uh, typically, patients are started on three anti-rejection medications and uh, another medication as part of what we call uh, induction therapy to reduce the immune system quickly so that rejection doesn't occur immediately. And then we start a lot of other medications, and these medications are all typically are all new for the patient and may cause side effects. Um, there's a psychosocial aspect of recovery as well in the uh, immediate and intermediate term. So a lot of patients may feel overwhelmed after surgery. They may become tremendously anxious, sometimes depressed, sometimes even angry. Uh, I've observed various emotions from patients. Um, and sometimes I have trouble explaining why patients experience those. Uh, I, I would go back to saying the same thing I said before. I think pre-transplant preparedness is incredibly important so that patients are ready uh, for uh, what may be coming at them uh, and can deal with side effects uh, and the recovery period uh, a lot better. Uh, and then for patients to meet their medical and surgical team because during the recovery phase, there are uh, nurses, critical care doctors, transplant pulmonary doctors, surgical doctors, transplant physician assistants, transplant floor nurses, and physical therapists. All these other people are involved in their care. So it, it is definitely very overwhelming, and the, the more prepared they are, the, the better they'll be able to accept all that. Yeah, the post-transplant care team after surgery typically involves uh, the medical transplant pulmonologist and the coordinator who work uh, very closely uh, with each other and with the patient to monitor their immediate progress. Um, typically the visits are once a week for three months with um, bronchoscopies that are performed in between some of the visits. So some weeks patients are coming to our center twice uh, to have a visit uh, as well as a bronchoscopy. Each visit consists of a chest x-ray, pulmonary function test, uh, laboratory work uh, through blood draw, uh, an examination, conversation, review of medications to prevent errors, uh, followed by what we like to call a sign-out the next day 
uh, during which the transplant pulmonologist and the coordinator reviews the labs and the coordinator calls the patients to execute changes in medications. And this process is done over and over, week after week, for the first three months. If all is going well, beyond the first three months, the visits are stretched out to every three to four weeks, and that continues for about a year. In our program, we have a surveillance bronchoscopy uh, policy, which involves uh, performing bronchoscopies at four to six weeks, followed by three months after surgery, followed by six, nine, and 12 months. Having said that, sometimes patient, patients present with new pulmonary symptoms or decline in their lung function as measured by home or office uh, spirometry, in which case we may want to do an additional bronchoscopy to look for rejection or infection. Um, certainly the patient and his or her family or friends uh, are a big part of this equation because patients do have to come to the visits. They do have to endure half a day at our center to go through all these tests that I mentioned, sometimes prolonged waiting time in the waiting room because it's so busy. Um, but you know, usually people are troopers and they get it done and they happily do it the following week. And we try to do our best to accommodate people so that they go through their day as easily as possible. But support is incredibly important during that time. Post lung transplantation, there are definitely bumps along the way. Some patients have more bumps than others. Uh, and in all honesty, some patients uh, do very well after transplant with very few medical um, setbacks. Others have constant problems, one after the other, and they get no relief. But many people fall in between those two extremes and have a bump here and a bump there. Uh, what I would say about those is that uh, one should be prepared for them, one should expect them, one should not be discouraged by them. Uh, bumps are common, but we could deal with most of them together if we work as a team.